Welcome to our daily devotion from St. Swithin's Church, Pimble, this Friday morning. Roger introduced our new series on Psalm 119 on Wednesday and looked at the first eight verses yesterday. The second section starts with a very important question. How can a young man keep his path pure? It's the answer to this question that gives us the key to singing the whole psalm with joy and confidence. And the answer isn't just for young men, it's for everyone. You see, the writer of the psalm is not preaching, but rather praying. As a young man, he's asking, Lord, how can I keep my path pure? How can I be this one who walks in the way of blessing? We read about in verse 2 of this psalm. And the question for us is, how can I sing this psalm with Jesus? Christopher Ash, who wrote the book we're basing this series on, says that unless we grasp the answer to this question, this psalm will remain locked away without the music. We can study it, but we will not sing it. As you can see, I'm sitting in the church's organ loft with the organ beside me and its majestic pipes behind. At the hands of a great organist like our own Peter Hamilton, the organ is a fabulous instrument with a tremendous range. On the one hand, it can accompany the most delicate soloists. On the other hand, when you pull out all the stops, it can blow your socks off. Now, of course, the organ is hard to beat when it comes to accompanying hymns. But punk rock bands don't tend to use it. And for good reason. It just doesn't go with the words they're singing. Psalm 119 talks a lot about God's law, using words like instruction, precept, statute and commandment. And so on the face of it, Psalm 119 can sound very legalistic. But trying to sing Psalm 119 as if it was all about keeping the law and rejoicing in the righteousness achieved through our own good living. It's like setting the lyrics of a hymn to the music of a punk rock band. It is quite simply the wrong music. Christopher Ash says the right music for Psalm 119 is the music of grace and the melodies of Christ. When we sing Psalm 119, we must tie the law to God's gracious promises. To do that, we've got to do some preparatory groundwork in terms of interpretation. And so today, we're not actually going to look at the next section of eight verses, but rather at the eight word words that are repeated throughout the whole psalm. Firstly, the word instruction. This is the most common of the eight words. It occurs 25 times in all and is translated by the word law in the NIV. It's the Hebrew word Torah. It comes from the verb for teaching and is a comprehensive term for all words that give direction from God. Often this word is used to refer to the first five books of the Bible, the Torah of Moses. Ash argues that the word instruction helps to convey the broad sense of the word better than the NIV translation law, which we tend to associate with something restrictive and negative. The second word is testimonies. This conveys the idea of a word that bears witness to the faithfulness of the Lord and at the same time bears witness against the person who breaks faith with the Lord. The third word is precepts. Words appointed or charged by someone with authority. The fourth word is statutes. This word emphasizes the binding force and permanence of what is spoken. Then the word commandments refers to the straight authority of the Lord to give orders and expect them to be obeyed. Then the word judgments. This refers to the decision, ruling, or verdict of a judge. In scripture, it means primarily the decisions of God, the judge. But it also means the judgments we ought to make in response. 
We ought to judge as God judges, to make the same decisions. We ought to do his judgment. Then the word, word, the very common Hebrew word, dabar, is used in the prophets in the expression, the word of the Lord. It's also used of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words. And lastly, the word promise. And this simply refers to something spoken. And often in the Psalms, and especially in this Psalm 119, it has the sense of something promised. The author or or singer of Psalm 119 plays with these eight word words throughout the Psalm. Almost every verse contains one of them, although just occasionally a verse will contain two, uh, two of them or none. Roughly speaking, each section of eight verses contains each word once, although there are plenty of poetic variations. He uses them interchangeably. So, for example, he speaks equally of keeping the precepts, the statutes, the word, the testimonies, or the instruction. He asks to learn equally the judgments, the commandments, and the statutes, and so on. So we are to treat the variation as freshness of style more than distinctiveness of meaning. Now, while these eight words may express marginally distinct facets, Ash says they are facets of the one central jewel. And this jewel is the covenant. Although the word covenant never appears in the psalm, it dominates it from beginning to end because these words are covenant words. And covenant is the wallpaper of the psalm, says Ash. It lies behind every verse. Well, in Deuteronomy 33, verse 9, for example, observing the promise is equivalent to keeping the covenant. In Psalm 25, 10, keeping the covenant is the same as keeping the testimonies. The covenant is the relationship created and established by the Lord with his people through the redemption out of slavery in Egypt. God says to them, you will be my people and I will be your God. This means that all eight word words are two directional words whose first direction is grace. Only under grace do they call us to walk the way of the word. Our problem is that we read words like law and commandments to be one-way words, us working up to God. So God speaks from Mount Sinai and, and we hear him say, do this and don't do that. Be good boys and girls, don't be bad. And when we think this is what the eight words mean, we run into problems interpreting this psalm. Firstly, the author sounds impossibly self-righteous. And secondly, it's hard hard to understand how anyone can delight in such legalism. But to keep the covenant word is not and never was a matter of ticking boxes of a legal checklist. It was always intended to be a matter of the heart, where keeping the commandments and statutes of God is equivalent to fearing the Lord, walking in all his ways, loving him and serving him with a whole heart and soul. So as we go through this psalm, let's remember that these eight word words are two-way words whose first direction is grace. They begin with grace, but the grace of God trains us to renounce ungodliness. It writes the law in our hearts and moves us to keep it. These eight word words speak of both grace and response. When the author, the singer, says he rejoices in the word of God, he means two things which we need to hold together. First and foremost, he rejoices in the covenant promise of God, that is, in God's grace and redemption. But second, 
he rejoices in the sheer goodness of the response to which he is called in the Ten Words or the Ten Commandments, as we call them. Now, although it's going to make my devotion a good bit long, longer this morning, I really wanted to share with you what Christopher Ash has written about the Ten Commandments. And I want to do so by turning it into a prayer. So please do join me in this prayer based on the Ten Commandments. Heavenly Father, although we live in a world of many gods, may we learn to love you, the Lord our God who redeemed us, and may we turn away from all other gods. Help us to live under the grace of the Redeemer. Although we live in a world of idols, may we learn to hate idolatry, the shaping and fashioning of God to be the way we want God to be. In a world which holds God cheap, may we learn to love the name of God and to care for his honour and not to cheapen that name by the way we speak or behave. In a frenetic and anxious world, may we learn to love the Sabbath principle. Having tasted the goodness and sufficiency of God, help us gladly to both rest and allow others to rest with us. In a disordered world, we will honour our parents. We understand that this commandment is the tip of the iceberg of honouring those with human authority over us. May we submit gladly to this because we submit to your authority. In a world full of hate and anger, may we learn to shun any behaviour that harms or desires to harm another human being Help us to love our neighbour as ourselves. In an unfaithful world, help us to value sexual faithfulness in the covenant of marriage and to flee from sexual intimacy in all other contexts. We know that the universe rests on the covenant faithfulness of God. In an unjust world, may we learn to hate stealing and unjust business dealings. Help us to love generosity and to work that we may have something to share and give, because we know the God who richly gives us all things to enjoy. In a deceitful world, may we hate false witness, lying for our gain and another's harm. Help us to love the truth, because we know that God whose promises are always yes in Christ. In a self-obsessed world, may we learn to hate greed and covetousness, because we are learning to trust you who has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. Well, Ash goes on to say that it's legitimate to extrapolate from whatever scriptures the author of Psalm 119 had to the whole Bible that we have. And with that being the case, we may replace any of the eight word words by the words, the Bible. This is because, in essence, Scripture everywhere speaks of one covenant of grace in Christ. But that's probably another sermon or two in itself, and we've already gone way over time. So I do hope you can join us for one of our Sunday services uh, this Sunday, whether that be online or via Zoom. And please do tune in again next week for the continuation of our daily devotions on this great psalm. I do hope you have a great day and may God bless you.